Good morning, and happy Father's Day. If you have your Bible handy, you want to open to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We'll look at those first 13 verses, and I hope you brought your Bible with you, and I hope you always bring your Bible with you when you seek to worship and engage God through His Word. Again, happy Father's Day. Well, let me tell you about this pastor, Pastor Walt Kellestad. He, was a, he led a church in Phoenix, Arizona. He was on vacation with his family in England, finding rest and refreshment after suffering a heart attack. One day while he was in an English hot tub, his daughters ran over to him and said, Dad, Dad, you've got to try the sun shower. The what? The sun shower, it's that white tube over by the pool. You stand up in it and get a tan, but you also get totally refreshed. It's like standing on the beach in South Carolina. Walt was intrigued, and his daughters were insistent, so he forked over the pound for three minutes and gave it a try. Inside the sun shower, Walt found himself in a small closet. He read the instructions, part of which instructed him to put on a pair of goggles. He put them on, closed his eyes, and waited. Nothing happened. He put, of course, the one pound coin. Walt took off the goggles, put the coin in the slot, put the goggles back on, and shut his eyes tightly. Nothing happened. Well, he heard a slight whirring, but other than that, nothing. No refreshment, no awareness that anything had happened. Kind of like a microwave but less exciting. What did you think, his daughters asked. I, I guess I don't get it, said the father. I mean, it's okay, but probably something you girls would like better. The girls were disappointed. This, they couldn't understand why dad wasn't overwhelmed. The next week, back at the health club, the girls tried again. This time they insisted that dad Give it a go for six minutes. Maybe twice as much sun shower would do the trick. It was one of those moments when a father knows better than to argue. So he pulled out two one-pound coins and went inside. He got the goggles, closed his eyes, and waited. Remembered the coin, took off the goggles, dropped the coins in the slot, put on the goggles, shut his eyes, and listened to the whirring. It was a nothing experience if he'd ever had one. And a few minutes later, he gave the disappointing news to the girls once again. I really don't think it's for me, he told them. They looked at their dad as if he was completely daft, as they say in England. This is something for you and your friends to enjoy. The next week, they were back at the club. The girls have been talking. This time, they demanded nine minutes. Three coins, nine minutes. Walt gave up, went inside the closet, plunked the coins, put on the goggles, shut his eyes, and experienced nothing. Nine minutes of nothing is a long, long time. Somewhere in the darkness, Walt opened his eyes and looked for clues of what was supposed to be refreshing. He looked at the instructions again, studied his surroundings, and turned the doorknob. I turned the knob, Walt wrote, and the door opened to a room filled with the most refreshing light rays and replicated ocean breeze I could ever imagine. For three weeks, I'd been standing in the changing room. He wasn't getting it until he actually entered the sun shower. He didn't have a clue. Listen, some men stay just on the outside of what God wants every man to be. And some are right in the middle of that experience. In the Bible, an example of a man being the man God meant him to be was Samuel. He was the prophet who influenced the decisions of two kings, Saul and David. Listen, Samuel was an average kind of guy, not very charismatic. Samuel wasn't a politician, but he knew all the key leaders. Samuel 
wasn't wealthy. He didn't have the best of anything. But Samuel maxed out on being himself. Being the man God meant him to be. As a result, God used him in some incredible ways. If you're there with me in 1 Samuel chapter 16, I want to read those first 13 verses. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are, there, are all the young men here? And then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. I, I want us to take this one passage. This one widow window of Samuel's life and see in it five principles that show us how to be the man God meant you to be. Now this is a Father's Day message, but it applies to all men, and it applies to all believers. So you women, those of you men who are not fathers, you can all gain something as well as we engage the Lord through his word. First of these five principles to be the man meant you to be. Engage your culture without its sin. When this passage begins, Samuel was mourning the loss of Saul. Saul hadn't actually died, but his reign as king was as good as dead. Samuel was aware of all that was happening in Israel. In fact, as God's servant... He was ahead of the curve. But Samuel wasn't involved in the wrongdoing that had taken down Saul. And one day would get David as well. Our culture doesn't need a bunch of Christian hermits. You need to be aware of what is going on in the politics of your day. You should be aware of who's having a good year in baseball who is the current leader in NASCAR racing? If you want to impact your world and transform your culture, you need to engage it. You must engage it. Yet, you can't influence your culture if you're full 
of cultural pollution. If sin patterns grip your life, there's no way you can tell a friend or a family member or a stranger about what a difference it makes to know Jesus. It just won't happen. What we do always speaks and makes a sound which is louder than what we say. Always. That's just the way it is. What we do always speaks louder than what we say. Before there was television, there was a way to have minute-by-minute minute national notice. Floyd Collins got that kind of attention. Floyd, Floyd Collins, in 1925, stuck while exploring a cave, got stuck while exploring a cave near his home in Kentucky. It was off the beaten path a bit, and Floyd was trying to find another route into Mammoth Cave. He was a good caver, maybe the best in the area. When he got stuck, he was only 55 feet from the surface. The first newspaper article said it was expected that he'd be freed by the next day. But day by day, Floyd was still stuck. And the newspaper articles got bigger and bigger. Two weeks later, Nash, nation, a, a worldwide attention was focused on the man who could see freedom, but who couldn't get there. It was cold, dark, and damp in the cave, and Floyd eventually began hallucinating. Above Floyd, people gathered as if they come for a carnival. They began to gawk to be part of the spectacle, but precious few of them made the slightest effort to rescue Floyd Collins. At the end, an estimated 10,000 people were present when Floyd died. While he died, they ate hot dogs from vendors and read accounts of the crisis in the newspapers. How could 10,000 people watch a man die as if it was good entertainment? Listen, don't watch the, the people around you die without Jesus Christ. Rescue them. Explain the hope that is in you and make sure your actions back up your words. Show them. Tell them. And offer them the hope. Second of these five principles, be consistent in God's call without wavering. Samuel never wavered. From the time he answered God's call as a boy until the time he died. He lived a consistent life. Do you remember Samuel's call? He was in the care of Eli the priest as a young boy during a time of much corruption in the land and even at the tabernacle. Eli himself wasn't committed to serve God with his whole heart. He had good intentions, but the priest had no impact on his culture. The boy went to Eli one night asking why he had called Two more times, Samuel woke up the old priest saying, Here I am, for you called me. But look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. Look at verses 8 through 10. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Then he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Now Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. God gave Samuel a message. It was a tough one. The word was for the house of Eli. It was the last thing that Samuel wanted to do. But when Eli pressed him, Samuel gave the old man the bad news. And then Samuel told him, it says in 1 Samuel 3.18, everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Throughout his life, that's the Samuel you always saw. A rock solid, never miss a beat man. He was consistent. Later when Saul was king, God wanted Samuel to find a new king. How did the priest respond to an assignment that might get him killed? Samuel nodded his head and went to Jesse's house to find
find a new king. On another occasion, Saul hesitated on carrying out an execution order from God. Samuel manned up and did the job himself. Sometimes life can be tough. In fact, there are times when every decision is difficult. Yet tough or not, if you're going to be the man God wants you to be, you have to be consistent. Third, be content serving God without envy. Samuel never fretted about not being the king. How many people would be content hearing God say, you are not my choice, but you will choose the man who will be king? Take that experience in the workplace. There's a new job opening that you would like. You're not getting the job, but you're going to hire the one who does get it. How do you feel? That's what happened to Samuel. He ruled Israel as judge. Now I'm choosing a king to rule over it, but it won't be you, Samuel. However, you will pick the king for me. How did, how did Samuel handle it? He simply obeyed God and fulfilled his purpose. In the end, the priest had great influence over both kings he chose, Saul and David. In fact, Samuel had so much influence that when it came time to write the history of this era, the books weren't called Saul and da or David or first and second David. These books are first and second David. Samuel. Evangelist Billy Glass said, regardless of your past or your present, start where you are. Use what you've got and do what you can. Be content with where God has you at the moment. Don't miss the journey. Don't aim for a spot over the horizon and say to yourself, once I get there, I'll be happy. Once I get the promotion, I'll have enough money. Once I make the move, I won't work so hard. Once I get to that vacation, then I'll relax. Once I get that new truck, or the boat, or the new house. So many people live in a land just over the horizon. The land that is just out of reach. Listen. If you can't experience contentment where you are, don't expect to find it where you'll one day be. Samuel was absolutely content with who he was, right where God put him. And then fourth, know more about God than anything else. Did you hear me? Know more about God than anything else. Samuel knew the truth. <clears throat> he always had it right. And it was because he was so close to God. Samuel knew the truth because he knew God. One day, he looked for a new king among Jesse's sons. All the boys lined up for the review. But Samuel knew none of them was the right choice. Jesse knew his family might be blessed by the priest. And yet... David's father didn't think the boy worthy enough to even be invited to the party. Wow. If you've ever looked for the right person to hire, you know how tough it is to sort through the resumes, wade through the interviews, and call the references. They all look good. How do you know when you've found the right person? Samuel knew when he found the right person as soon as David walked in the room. And how? The quality that set David apart from his brothers was invisible to the human eye. He had a heart that searched for God's own heart. And because Samuel knew God so well, he also knew that David was the right man for the job even when nobody else knew. When you make God your top priority, it won't be long before it seems as if God is making you His top priority. That may not equate to success as the world sees it, 
but it will result in contentment and consistency and the other positives that are seen in Samuel's life. And then fifth, and finally, do the task regardless of the circumstances. Samuel was a get-it-done guy. God gave the command, Samuel got it done. It doesn't matter if the task required, it didn't matter if the task required warfare or a discerning spirit. It didn't matter if he was hungry or exhausted. It didn't matter if it was something he wanted to do or something he hated doing. It didn't matter if the stress was overwhelming or it was a walk in the park. Samuel just got it done. The made for TV movie Door to Door tells the story of Bill Porter. Bill was born with cerebral palsy, which made it difficult for him to speak clearly or to walk or to use his right arm. He was told that he would never be able to hold a job, never be able to take care of himself. The social service agencies labeled him as unemployable. They told him his only option would be to collect government disability checks for the rest of his life. But Bill wouldn't listen. He applied for a job with Watkins, a door-to-door -door household products company. At first they turned him down, but he persisted. He offered to take the worst territory in the city, an area no other salesman wanted, just to prove himself. Finally, the company relented and gave him a job. Straight commission, no salary. Bill walked 10 miles a day, ringing doorbell after doorbell, fighting against his crippled body, fighting against pain and weakness and fatigue, not to mention the difficulties of just speaking, just communicating with people. When he made a sale, he had to have the customer fill out the order form because he couldn't hold a pen to write. He became the company's top salesman, first in that city, then in the region, and finally in the entire country for more than 40 years. He achieved all this even though he couldn't tie his own shoes or button his own collar. Bill doesn't define himself as disabled, nor does he view himself as some kind of hero. He's just someone who has a job to do and who gets up every morning and does it whether he feels like it or not. Another example, Todd Beamer became the man he was meant to be the very instant we needed a hero. It was September 11, 2001, and the world was coming unglued. Planes had crashed into both towers of the World Trade Center. Another plane had intentionally crashed into the Pentagon. Smoke and flames were rising in the air, surrounded by the sounds of sirens, screams, and speechless news commentators. Todd Beamer was just trying to get to work, flying from Newark to San Francisco when Flight 93 was suddenly hijacked. Todd found himself in the back of a 737 with nine other passengers and five flight attendants. Another 27 passengers had been forced to the front of the, front of the plane where hijackers had wounded or killed the pilot and co-pilot. Using the GTE in-flight phone, Todd got through to Lisa. GTE supervisor. Within a few minutes, the group had learned what had happened in New York and Washington and what was planned to happen to them. Todd says on the phone, giving authorities invaluable information about the situation. He also told Lisa that the passengers and flight attendants had decided to do what they could to foil the hijackers' plans. And that's where it all came together. Todd Beamer was a man of great faith. He was committed to Bible studies and the fellowship of his church. He didn't play church or religion. He was plugged into the real thing. Todd was already getting it done when the most important moment of his life was suddenly upon him. Todd didn't have to waste time trying to match his actions to his words. He was already in the habit of consistency. He was struggling in some areas, but he was getting it done following Jesus. Todd had found the focus of his life, and it had changed him profoundly. His prayer life 
was the fuel behind his success as a software salesman. His faith in Christ was helping him balance an overbooked work schedule with his family responsibilities. Little did Todd Beamer know that he was about to become the only reason Americans would cheer on such a grief-stricken day. Still on the phone with Lisa, Todd asked her to call his wife and tell her that he loved her. Then he asked the stranger on the phone to pray with him. He told her he knew he wasn't going to make it when they jumped the hijack. Todd asked Jesus to help him. He left the phone off the hook hoping to help the authorities even more. And that's how Lisa heard the beginnings of the revolt. Todd looked 13 fellow Americans in the eye and said, are you guys ready? Let's roll. Lisa heard some noise, lost the connection, and later discovered that Flight 93 had crashed into a Pennsylvania field. All on board perished but the plans of the terrorists also perished. Todd and the others gave up their lives, saving the lives of untold Americans. There comes a moment in every man, or there comes a moment when every man needs to look himself in the heart and ask himself, is this the moment I become the man I was meant to be? Maybe today is that day for you the day you commit your life to Jesus Christ. Begin to follow the teachings of the Bible and begin and become a committed servant in the church. Is today your day? It can be. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Every one of us need that salvation. Romans 3.23 says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. That means every one of us are in the same place. And the wages of sin is death. That means not just physical death, but death separated from God for all of eternity in hell. But, Romans 6.23 says also, the free gift of God is eternal life by Christ Jesus. And that's because God loves us. He doesn't want us to spend an eternity apart from Him. He wants us to be with Him in heaven for all of eternity John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And how did God demonstrate that love? Well, it says he gave his only begotten son. Romans 5.8 says, and God demonstrated his life toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We need to acknowledge Jesus died for us and rose from the dead. And then he can give us that. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the mouth confession is made and with the heart we believe of the righteousness. Romans 10, 9 and 10. But we need to reach out and ask for that forgiveness. For all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 10, 13. Let me ask you, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Have you asked him to forgive you and be your Savior? And are you saved, if you are a Christian, are you serving him as Lord? Are you being or becoming the man, the woman, the person that God means you to be? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony of Samuel, your servant. Father, may we all make the commitment to become the person that you would call, you mean us to be, that you called us to be. Father, I pray that you would deal with each one of us, every person watching or listening to this message, that you would do business in each one of our hearts, calling us to yourself, giving us the grace to act upon that conviction. And Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name. Be the man, be the woman, be the person that God means you to be.